Welcome to Shades of Migraine, a podcast series created by the Association of Migraine Disorders. Migraine isn't black and white, it's blurry and shadowy, but there are many forces at work trying to change how we think about and deal with this disease. We hope you'll enjoy listening to a wide variety of voices, including the perspectives of both people living with migraine and those that are trying to help. Each will share their unique shade of migraine. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Michael Teixeira, an ENT and neurologist in Wilmington, Delaware, who specializes in medical and surgical conditions that affect hearing and balance. Dr. Teixeira is going to talk to us about the sensitive brain of a migrainer, as well as migraine triggers. The brain of a migraineur is exquisitely sensitive. Um, we want to be able to detect stimuli, and to, and, but we don't want to be overwhelmed by the stimuli which we detect. This gets to the heart of a question that, that about dysfunction in migraineurs uh, that we call a defect in habituation. So if I walk out into the bright sunlight, it's very bright for me initially, but I can adapt uh, not only does my eye adapt by constricting the pupil, but my brain adapts to the intense amount of illumination and will stop being overwhelmed in a very short period of time. The brain of a migraineur, however, will continue to be overwhelmed and will not habituate the way a non-migraineur will. And, in fact, they will continue to have increasing levels of central stimulation until they reach a critical point. And that critical point is their threshold for triggering of a migraine episode. And I think that most migraineurs do have uh, experience with this phenomena in which they're overwhelmed by some aspect of their physical environment. They attempt to adapt, they cannot. They insist, however, on staying in the environment, but if they insist too far, they can no longer leave the environment and feel better because a physiologic cascade of the migraine attack has begun and now has to run its course. When a patient has uh, migraine, their brain, which is already sensitive, becomes even more sensitive. If I have peripheral pain, maybe back pain, and my pain level is only a two or a three out of 10, when I'm having a migraine episode, my pain level may rise to five or six out of 10. In that case, I have a peripheral problem that's real in my back, but my perception of it is increased because my brain is much more sensitive during the migraine episode. There are three main categories of triggers for migraine. Those are physiologic triggers, environmental triggers, and food triggers. A physiologic trigger, uh, is, examples of physiologic triggers are hormones, uh, allergy, uh, dehydration, hunger, uh, sleep, or lack of sleep. Some, for some people, oversleeping on the weekend is a, just a death sentence in terms of migraine. and um, we know that uh, each individual exercise is a common physiologic trigger. Uh, odors, uh, so, so now we're going to get into um, uh, other sorts of environmental triggers. So in patients uh, with migraine have a sensitive brain, and the sensitive brain is something that uh, is sensitive to any sort of excess sensory stimulation. So if you follow down your senses, any excessive pain, uh, touch, uh, visual s stimulation, sound, motion, smells, uh, are, uh, can provoke a migraine attack for very many migraineers. Food triggers is a, are a a uh, very important part of migraine management because many patients wish to solve their problems without uh, taking medications. In typ typically, patients who have dizziness related to migraine do not have symptoms that will respond to medications to eliminate symptoms when they are occurring. They 
therefore have to prevent their symptoms by taking medications that elevate the threshold for triggering of migraine or in other words stabilize the head against uh, the um, a possibility of abnormal migraine activity. Food triggers have been known, have been recognized for hundreds of years um, as aggravating factors that can precipitate migraine attacks. Scientifically, they are difficult to identify and prove because most food triggers are not very strong they are only partial triggers. And it is only when uh, an accumulation of partial triggers puts a patient over their personal migraine threshold that their symptoms may emerge. So a food which is a partial trigger for me um, may be something that I eat relatively frequently, but only occasionally is it the factor that puts my migraine symptom uh, accumulation over my threshold and cause symptoms. Well, I think there is the, there is the chicken and the egg, um, and there are feedback loops in migraine, and we try to interrupt them. Hunger is certainly a common trigger uh, that is a recognized physiologic trigger of migraine. But beyond uh, that, there are specific categories of food triggers. Some foods have. Uh, very complex chemistries. Uh, these are a, the products of aging and fermentation, uh, have chemical soups which find their way into the central nervous system and alter function in a way that the sensitive brain of a migraineur um, may um, uh, be uh, stimulated by. There are other categories of food triggers um, in which resemble central neurotransmitters directly, like caffeine, like the xanthines in chocolate, uh, like tyramine in aged cheeses, and um, even glutamate, something which has been studied and talked about. And some people believe strongly that it is a trigger, some people strongly that it is not a trigger, uh, but uh, it is all glut uh, glutamate is a central a nervous system stimulatory neurotransmitter. There is another category of food triggers which we call mystery foods. We just don't know the chemical nature or a possible chemical nature of the, um, of the irritant in, the, in foods like bananas and peanuts, uh, yet they are unquestionably um, unequivocal triggers for many patients. When a patient has intermittency in their headache pattern, now lots of other good things happen, especially in the area of triggers. If I'm living above my threshold and I have constant migraine activity, how can I tell what my trigger is? It's I'm over threshold every day for one reason or another, but if I achieve a level of intermittency because of a combination of preventive medications and some sort of block that can be repeated, then I may be doing well for four or five days, but then I'll have a headache day come and I can, with my knowledge of the environmental, the, physiolo uh, the physiologic, and the dietary triggers, uh, look back and say, over the last 36 hours, what was different? Why am I having a headache today, but I didn't the previous five days? And over a period of four or five or ten attacks, a pattern will begin to emerge. And from that whole panel of different possible triggers, most patients will discover that the same two or three triggers are their strongest and responsible for most of their breakthrough attacks. Now they know exactly where to apply their attention and their energies to achieve wellness. In our next segment, we will hear from Dr. Dale Bond, a Brown University professor who is researching the effects of behavioral weight loss interventions on migraine. Dr. Bond will talk to us about the connections between migraine and obesity, migraine and depression, behavioral associations, as well as tracking physiological changes through a smartphone app. 
And thank you for tuning in to Shades of Migraine. For more information about migraine disease, please visit migrainedisorders.org.